Absolutely amazing. Thanks so much, James. And uh, I'm just starting my own clock here so I don't get into trouble uh, this evening. Uh, but so good to have you with us. And uh, if somebody could go online and, and sign James up for the marriage initiative, please, uh, so that he stops forgetting it. I think that would be the best way uh, to help. But uh, I echo everything James has been saying uh, just from my side. Uh, if you have a teenager in your life, if you've got a grade 7 to 12 in your life, uh, do get them signed up for youth conference coming up this weekend. Uh, I can tell you right now, uh, from my own experience, youth conferences, God does something very special in teenagers' lives when they gather together for moments like this. And uh, this one is going to be no different. It's going to be live on YouTube. And uh, we're just so excited. So please do that. Get your uh, high schoolers signed up. Uh, and everything else, Initiative Block, Good Place, Baptisms, uh, so much going on in this great month of September. And we believe God is going to be doing supernatural work uh, in all of our lives through this. A very warm welcome to you wherever you may find yourself. Audience, may I start just to let you know that uh, you just keep getting better and better. Uh, this is a great audience here with us tonight, uh, and wherever you are watching from home right now, it's so good uh, that we're able to connect uh, in this way every single week. I'm going to jump in tonight into our preach, and if you have been tracking with us over the past couple of weeks, you will know that we are now in the middle of a series that we are calling Friend of Blank. Uh, you can see it here behind me, and uh, in this series, what we're doing is we're looking at, the, at various encounters um, that Jesus has with different people who for one reason or another uh, found themselves feeling disqualified uh, for receiving the love and the affection and the friendship of Jesus. Uh, now, there's literally dozens of options uh, of these available, dozens of examples of this throughout the New Testament. Uh, two weeks ago, if you've been with us, Duncan looked at the demon-possessed man. Uh, last weekend, Vaughan looked at the woman at the well. And so Jesus, the afflicted, Jesus, the, the, friend, of, uh, Jesus, the friend of the afflicted, Jesus, the friend of the outcast. And I know that so many of us over the past weeks have been able to deeply identify uh, with things that we can learn from these characters. Now today what we're doing, it's a little bit different, is we're, we're not just looking at one individual uh, encounter that Jesus had with an individual, but actually an encounter with a group of people in the New Testament. And uh, this group at one particular time all displayed uh, a behavior uh, that could have easily made them feel inferior or even disqualified from the friendship of Jesus. Now, you may have heard of this group. Uh, they're quite famous. They're quite well known. Uh, hands up if you've ever heard of the disciples. Anyone in the room? Yes, we've got a bright audience here. Well done. At home, the disciples. A uh, well known group uh, in the Bible. And so we're going to be looking at this group uh, and a particular example around them. And you might be wondering to yourself, what on earth uh, could the disciples have done to make them feel undeserving of the friendship of Jesus, of the very one that they were following uh, in the New Testament? And it's a really good question. I'm so glad you asked it. Uh, we're going to dive in uh, and look at this tonight. So let's find out. What actually makes this particular encounter with Jesus even more unusual than anything that we've heard so far in the series is that this encounter actually happens after Jesus has already died. It's an encounter with Jesus uh, after he has already died. So let's take a look at uh, the story. To set the scene, we're in the night of the crucifixion, the night that Jesus has now been put uh, to death on the cross. And I don't know if you've ever taken a moment to try to uh, think to yourself, to try to imagine for yourself what the atmosphere must have felt like on that night. It, it was a very historic night. It's a famous night. But what was the atmosphere around that night? Well, it was Passover time in Jerusalem. And so what that would have meant is that the, the, the population of the city would have swelled multiple times its usual size. There would have been crowds absolutely everywhere. There were Jewish people who would have come from other, other parts of the, of the land and so speaking other languages, so they will be part of the crowds. I can imagine that there would have been vendors in the streets all over the place selling their wares. Uh, I can imagine all the housing in the whole city would have been jam-packed all the way up to the edges of the city. I think there would have been people arguing, shouting. There would have been different languages, different tones. Uh, there, there would have been howling mobs of people moving through uh, the city, which could have easily been stirred into violence. Added to everything, there was a severe military presence in the streets of the city. And so I think that the atmosphere in the air would have been one of extreme anxiety right throughout the city that night. 
If you know the story, you'll know that Jesus is crucified. He's then placed in the tomb. And we fast forward to a moment that we're going to focus on now where Mary Magdalene has arrived at the tomb on the Sunday. And she arrives at the tomb of Jesus to find that the stone has been rolled away. She finds an, an empty tomb. And so she, she runs and she tells Simon Peter and she tells another disciple. And they run together and they find this empty tomb with the linen cloths folded and put to the side. After the disciples have left, we, we read that Mary was still there. She was still weeping at the tomb when two angels appeared beside her to ask her why she was weeping. And as Mary's talking to these angels next to her, she turns around to find what turns out to be Jesus himself standing right beside her. After this encounter, Mary then goes to tell the disciples that she has seen the Lord and what the Lord has said to her. And we're going to pick up on the story. You can read along with me right now. It's uh, in the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verse 19 to 22. It says, On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus says to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. Now that very first verse in this portion of scripture that we read that says, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, it sounds like a minor little sentence in the context of the whole thing, but actually it's that sentence that communicates the terror and bewilderment that the disciples must have been feeling, they must have been plagued by in the immediate aftermath of Jesus' resurrection. We presented with this, this scene of fearful tension. The disciples are there, they're gathered in this room, they've turned in even on one another, and it tells us that the doors are bolted shut. The imagery of these doors, doors that are locked, doors that are properly bolted shut, gives us a glimpse into the utter fear that the disciples must have been experiencing in this moment. They're frightened and they're perplexed at the death of Jesus. They don't understand the disappearance of his body and then this extraordinary witness of Mary Magdalene after his resurrection. They're in fear of the Jews and they're at a loss to explain everything that has happened and what they're going to do as a result of everything that has just transpired. So it's clear that the disciples were very, very afraid. And they remained so even after Jesus appears in their midst, which is an interesting thing. I think it's easy for us to imagine that the resurrection just automatically and magically changed everything that the disciples had been experiencing at the moment. But in truth, that didn't actually happen. You see, the disciples in this moment had no purpose beyond keeping themselves safe from the authorities. The aftermath of the resurrection is marked with fear, with failure, and with doubt. In a very similar way, you and me right now in this moment, maybe even after everything that we know about God, may still find ourselves locked in our own version of an upper room, marred with fear that we're facing in and of ourselves. I wonder if even today, as you're watching this, there's some locked doors up in your own life. Maybe there's some doors in your life that are locked and bolted shut in fear of something that you're facing in this moment right now. Maybe even over these months as we've spent months in actual physical lockdown, despite that we know God, despite that we are able to hear the voice of God, we've still been experiencing fear in our own hearts. I think what this series that we're in at the moment serves to remind us of afresh is that no matter where you find yourself, the friendship 
and the love and the affection of Jesus is always there. Jesus is a, a God who will always meet us exactly where we're at. And so what we find here in the story and what you will find in your own life is in your state of fear, even in a state of, of deep and intense fear that you might be experiencing as the disciples were, Jesus comes and addresses that fear. And uh, there's three ways uh, tonight that we're going to look at that Jesus addresses the fear of our hearts. Are you ready? Yes. All right. First way that Jesus addresses our fear is that he gives us his peace. He gives us his peace. Verse 19, uh, again, on the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. And then after he had shown them his hands and his side to prove that it was indeed him, he repeats that line again, peace be with you. You see, these men were in hiding behind these locked doors physically because of the fear of the Jewish leaders who had just crucified their Lord. And it's not a far-fetched thing to imagine uh, that they could have been thinking that they were next. And so they might have been there in the room discussing how they might sneak out of Jerusalem without being arrested. And then suddenly, with no knock at the door, without anybody opening that door, the risen Lord Jesus is standing there right next to them. And, and while this resurrection body is a physical body, it also has the ability to appear and disappear at will. <laughs> Can you imagine how startling that must have been to this group of disciples who were already in such a state of fear? In fact, Luke 24 tells us that not only were they frightened, they actually thought that they were seeing a ghost next to them. So keep in mind that these are men who had fled in fear for their own lives when Jesus was arrested. Peter had denied the Lord three times, and they had all doubted initial reports of Jesus' resurrection. And so it certainly would have been understandable if Jesus had greeted them by saying, you unbelieving idiot excuses for disciples, when are you going to get it together? You know, we, we, you, that would probably would have been all right for Jesus to say, but he doesn't say that. That's not how Jesus comes through the door. Rather than rebuking them, the Lord graciously extends and then repeats his peace to them. I think it's interesting that when Jesus appears in their midst, he doesn't give any preamble. He just gives them what they most deeply and earnestly desire, peace. Such a simple greeting, and yet within his peace, within Jesus, is to be found every one of our soul's greatest and fullest fulfillment. Within the peace of Jesus is to be found every one of our soul's greatest and fullest fulfillment. And then Jesus shows his hands and his side. He reassures them that it's him that is risen, and he says it again, peace be with you. I wonder how many of you, and this happens to me all the time, <laughs> ever find yourself in one of those situations that is either so embarrassing or so awkward that you literally just wish the floor would open up underneath and eat you. <laughs> For me, it's not only awkward, uh, more than embarrassing, uh, but it happens to me all the time. But more seriously, I wonder how many of you, in the midst of fear, in the midst of deep fear in your heart, have ever found yourself either wishing to be magically removed from that fear or the situation to be magically removed from you. The peace that Jesus comes and offers the disciples isn't a peace that just suddenly lifts the disciples out of their difficult situation, but it's a peace that sustains them in the midst of it. It's a peace that will sustain you in the midst of your fear. And while God certainly does have the ability to remove you from a situation or to remove a situation from you, uh, what we see so often in the character of God is that instead of removing you from the situation, He sustains you through the situation. It's the same uh, peace 
uh, that we read about when Jesus himself had fallen asleep in the boat uh, if, uh, earlier on in this gospel during a life-threatening storm on Galilee. It's the peace that Jesus himself experienced and offered uh, to the disciples on the boat as well. Now, I know that while we are a generation that knows all about instant gratification, what I also know about us as humans is that our acceptance of the peace that Jesus offers doesn't necessarily come easily or quickly to us. Because the second time that Jesus appears to the disciples, they still have that door bolted closed. And he has to repeat the words again, peace be with you. And some things often have to be repeated again and again and again before they actually mean something to us and before that we can accept them. I don't know how many parents are watching tonight, but uh, I know that I'm guilty of this. I often say to my kids, I'm going to say this once and only once. Anyone remember your parents with that thread? I'm going to say this one time only, only once. But that's not what Jesus does. Jesus comes again and again and again with his words of promise, peace be with you. And so right now, I wonder what your fears are in your life. What is happening right now in your life? What's happening right now to your family? What are those things that are keeping you up at three o'clock in the morning? What are those thoughts that are coming into your mind time and time and time again during the day? Does it feel like these things are robbing you of your peace? I wonder what you might be using as a locked door in your own life today to try to protect you. Because I want you to know this evening that Jesus is not only standing on the other side of the locked doors that you might put up in your own life, but he has the ability to walk through that door and straight into the heart of your fear. Jesus may not take the issues away from you, but he is with you in them. And do you realize tonight that he is consistently, repeatedly saying to you in a very gentle but insistent voice, peace be with you. We can jump back into our text now because now that Jesus has given his peace to the disciples, he can begin to empower this group to give them the sense of purpose and direction that they've actually lost in this moment. And so the first one, Jesus, he gives us his peace. Point number two, he gives us his purpose. He gives us his purpose. Now that he's given his peace to the disciples, he can reveal to the disciples their purpose. And I think that this came second in the order of what happened that night because it reminds us that when our souls are not at peace, we will find ourselves lacking in our ability to fulfill the purpose that God has for your life. When your soul is not at peace, you will find yourself lacking in the purpose that God has for your life. There is a purpose that God has for every single one of our lives. It's the purpose that he gives his disciples in this moment. And it is also Jesus' purpose himself, that we would be God's representatives on earth. Verse 21 of this passage said, As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. And so the disciples in this moment are charged with the task of spreading the gospel of Christ to Jew and to Gentile alike. Their place is not behind a locked and barricaded door of a house in Jerusalem. Their place is in the world amongst its people. Their place is not to hide in fear, but to go in peace and spread the word of God. The imagery of this locked door is once again so pertinent in this moment. The locked, barricaded door that you have up in your life right now could be the very thing that is standing in the way of you fulfilling the purpose that God has for your life. I love the Gospel of John. I think it's awesome because it's always so clear about what Jesus came for. Maybe some of you watching now are new to all of this and, and not sure about what this is, but John tells us uh, so clearly the purpose that Jesus had. It applies to Jesus' prayer in John 17 when he says to the disciples, um, as you, as Jesus says, as you sent me into the world, I have also sent them into the world. 
John's gospel frequently emphasizes the theme of Jesus being sent by the Father. It tells us he was sent to do the Father's will. He was sent to speak the Father's words. He was sent to perform the Father's works. He was sent to bring salvation to the world. I love John, 7, uh, John um, 18 verse 37 where Jesus says, For this purpose I was born. For this purpose I have come into the world that I would be a witness to the truth. Luke tells us that Jesus said, For the Son of Man has come to seek and save the lost. And the Apostle Paul puts it in 1 uh, Timothy that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners among whom I am the foremost of all. I love that Jesus taught us to pray, Matthew 6.10, Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus came to establish the Father's kingdom by bringing people to his will. By sending us in the same way that he was sent, the very purpose of Jesus becomes our purpose. And so you and I should live in obedience to Christ and teach others to do the same. We all have that exact same purpose, as we put it here, to help people get and keep Jesus first in their lives. And so in living out this purpose uh, from his Father, Jesus became known as the friend of sinners. He said in Luke 5 verse 32, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And so if Jesus' purpose was to seek and save the lost, shouldn't that be every single one of our purpose? To tell people the good news about eternal life is the greatest purpose that any single one of us can have, because that is the purpose of Jesus. So second way that he deals with our fear is he gives us his purpose. And then the last thing that he does as he's dealing with the fear of the disciples and the, what he does for us deal, in dealing with our own fear is he gives us his presence. Having given, G, uh, having given the disciples his peace and his purpose, he now promises them the presence of the Holy Spirit which they will need to carry out his divine will on the earth. And it is by the gift and the presence of the Holy Spirit that the disciples will be able to do God's will. Without the Spirit to strengthen and guide them, they would just flounder in this hostile world in which they find themselves. John 20 verse 22, it tells us there, he breathed on them and he said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. Receive it. And what it's telling us is that the Spirit is a gift. It's something to be received. The Holy Spirit can't be taken. It can only be received. And so the gift must be accepted or else it's rejected. And it's His presence that brings peace. In the story of that storm that I mentioned earlier, it's the very presence of Jesus that calms the storm in the midst of the fear that they found themselves in. And so tonight, whatever storm you're in, whatever storm you're facing right now, I want you to take heart that it's not about the storm, but it's about who is with you in the midst of the storm. Jesus, the Prince of Peace, is with you tonight in your storm. You know, the beautiful presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives is the only hope that we have for accomplishing the purpose that he created us for. It is the only hope that we have, this beautiful gift of the Holy Spirit. For us to attempt to serve the Lord in any capacity, but especially in proclaiming the good news and being a friend of the sinner, without living in the presence of the Holy Spirit and without relying on the power of the Holy Spirit would be futile. Zechariah 4 verse 6 reminds us that it is not by might, it is not by power, but it is by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. And so tonight as we start to wrap up, it's a beautiful thing to remember and to realize tonight that even in our fear, even in the very heart of the fear that you might be facing tonight, Jesus meets us as a friend. In our own fear, 
in our own anxiety, in our own doubt, in our, our own uncertainty, how incredible is it that we have a risen Savior who offers us His peace, His purpose, and His presence. If we go back to that imagery of these locked doors that we found throughout this evening, you know what I love most about the story is that those disciples who were at first overcome with fear, but then came face to face with Jesus himself, they do finally walk out of those doors. But the beautiful thing is that they don't walk out the same. They don't walk out alone. After this phenomenal encounter with Jesus, the friend of the fearful, they walk out with peace. They walk out with a renewed sense of purpose. And they walk out with the beautiful presence of the Holy Spirit. And so right now in our, in our last few minutes, I'm just going to ask you, wherever you are watching, why don't you take a moment and just close your eyes as you reflect on what we've well, looked at tonight and as you reflect on what God has been saying to you tonight. And I'd love the opportunity to be able to pray into that with you. Jesus, we want to first of all pause and say thank you so much for what you offer us. We want to say thank you for uh, the friendship that you are able to offer us even in the heart of our fear. That even in a place of deep fearfulness, of real fear, fearfulness, that you are a friend to us and that you are there for us. Lord, I thank you that you will walk through any door to get to us and to deal with whatever we're going through. I thank you for your peace, Jesus. I thank you for your purpose. And I thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit. And so tonight, if you're here and symbolically you're lifting up your hand to say, it's the peace of Jesus that is what I need in my life right now. My heart and my soul are yearning and calling out for that peace of Jesus that I feel like I have lost. Lord, I will pray for every single person right now looking for that. I pray, Lord Jesus, that supernaturally you would impart your peace into people's hearts right now. Lord, as people are watching, as people are responding, I pray supernaturally, Jesus, impart your peace. We thank you that you are the Prince of Peace. And so make that real, I pray, Lord Jesus, for people in this moment. For anyone who's here and they're saying, well, what I've lost in these last six months is a sense of purpose. I've lost the purpose that I know Jesus has given me. Lord Jesus, I pray for every single person with their hands up for that category. And I pray, Lord Jesus, won't you reignite in us the purpose that you had for yourself, the purpose that you gave your disciples, and the purpose that you give every single one of us, that you are sending us out. Lord, I thank you for the word that you gave us to be hope bringers to Joburg and South Africa and all humanity. And Lord, for any person who is saying, I've lost that, I've lost that sense of purpose. Lord, won't you reignite that in our hearts tonight, we pray. And then finally, if you are here and you're saying it's the Holy Spirit that I need. If you found yourself potentially over these months uh, starting to lean on yourself, on your own might, on your own power. Uh, you're ready to just relinquish that and say it's the Holy Spirit that I need in my life right now. It's the beautiful presence and the power that comes from the Holy Spirit is what I need. I pray, won't you do that, Jesus? Won't you just uh, impart to us all once again your beautiful Holy Spirit into our lives? That we would walk and that we would work and that we would minister and that we would be friends uh, in the power and the presence of your Holy Spirit, Jesus. I want to take a moment right now. I just want to ask uh, us in the room, why don't we stand up together? Where are you at home? If you would stand with us to pray for this church of ours. Uh, I really do believe that, that, that God is doing something new in the life of this church in this season. I really do believe that there is supernatural things that God is doing and wants to do in every one of our lives this month. And so I pray, Father God, right now for this church, God First City Church. Lord, I thank you for all that you're doing. I thank you for all that you have done. I thank you for the testimonies upon testimonies upon testimonies. The stories, Lord Jesus, of what you have done in people's lives in this year. Lord, I thank you that you are not finished. 
that you are not done, Lord Jesus. I thank you that as we turn our attention and we look forward, and as we listen to what you are saying about what the future of this church looks like in this new season, that we go through the doors that may be around us, Lord Jesus. Lord, that you would smash down doors, that you would smash down locked and barricaded doors that are in front of us, that we can walk out in peace, that we can walk out with purpose, and that we can walk in the beauty and presence of the Holy Spirit. We depend on that, Jesus. And we take a moment to say that we just love you. In this room and wherever you are right now, why don't you lift up that to Jesus? Just say, we love you, Jesus. We worship you alone, Jesus. We fix our eyes. We thank you for this reminder from Youth Conference. We fix our eyes on the King of Kings and the only one that will ever sustain us, Jesus Christ. We bless you and honor you and love you. We put ourselves firmly in your hands and we say, Jesus, have your way. Jesus, have your will. Do your will. Have your way in our lives, Father God. We love you so much. And we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we can't let this moment go without worshiping Him, the one that died for us. And so let's take a moment as we go into our last time of worship. <laughs>